I spent the first five years of my career as an emergency department social worker, an environment that often serves as a parameter of how well the healthcare system is working or not working, as the case may be. It's been said that emergency departments are the United States version of universal health coverage because ERs are required to assess and stabilize patients regardless of their ability to pay. But as many have learned the hard way, if you need anything else, like ongoing treatment, it really helps to have health insurance or a trust fund. So what happens if an ER diagnoses you with cancer or diabetes? What do you do if you don't have insurance or money? I learned very quickly as a social worker that the answer to those questions can depend on where you live and what your state policymakers think they know about Medicaid. After routinely becoming frustrated and disheartened by trying to help patients navigate impossible circumstances, I left my clinical practice to focus on informing health policy with research. I've since spent the last decade studying the Medicaid program. Medicaid, at its simplest definition, is health insurance for the poor, many who would otherwise be uninsured. Eligibility for the program varies state by state, but currently about 75 million children, adults, and elderly Americans are enrolled. About 12 million em enrollees are there because of the Affordable Care Act, where 31 states used ACA funding to expand their Medicaid program. 19 states are still trying to decide if it's worth doing. Recently, and for a while now, Congress has been debating repealing the ACA and fundamentally downsizing the program. There's a lot at stake for patients who need and depend on the Medicaid program. And the same could be said for taxpayers and the government who pay for the program. There have been lines drawn in the sand, and both sides come armed with data. When it comes to the future of the Medicaid program, it seems that we can't agree on goals, we definitely don't agree on policies. But the really troubling thing is, we can't agree on facts, or even that there is such a thing as facts. Here's the problem. It isn't random that people are on Medicaid. One of the common qualifiers for the Medicaid program is having a disability. And when you compare people with a disability with presumably healthier uninsured people, you have a weak study design and the potential to draw misleading conclusions. Are people sicker because having a disability is what made them eligible for the program in the first place? Or did the program cause harm? The inability to tease this out has led to some pervasive myths about the Medicaid program. And I think we should examine those myths carefully. Myth one, Medicaid is bad insurance because no provider will see you if you have it. Myth two, Quality of care on Medicaid is so poor that it can actually be bad for you. Myth three, Medicaid isn't providing anything that somebody couldn't already get through the healthcare safety net. These are serious allegations. No wonder so many states have resisted expanding Medicaid or refused altogether. No wonder some members of Congress hope that the next generation of health reform will mean less Medicaid funding and fewer enrollees. If Medicaid is indeed bad insurance, we should all share the same hope that there's less Medicaid in America's future. Why then do so many patients protest when Medicaid is threatened? And why do so many people sign up in the first place? I would like to share some insight for the most rigorous study of Medicaid to date. A little background. Before the ACA, the state of Oregon wanted to expand their Medicaid program, one that didn't require you to have a disability, but did still require you to be poor. Oregon had just enough money to cover 10,000 more people and to give everybody in the state the same chance at this limited opportunity, they held a Medicaid lottery and about 90,000 people signed up to participate. This is unconventional social policy born out of a desire to do as much good as possible when resources were limited. 
And it also, also offered the opportunity to do a gold standard research study by comparing those who won Medicaid to those who didn't. The random assignment allowed us to assess causal pathways between Medicaid and patient outcomes, taking out any bias that could be introduced by trying to compare groups that could be inherently different. We followed people who signed up for the Medicaid lottery for about two years, winners and losers, who we call the control group. We surveyed them multiple times, gave them a health screening, and examined records from credit reports, emergency room visits, and hospitalizations. The study is called the Oregon Health Insurance Experiment, and findings from this research can give us some solid ground to stand on when evaluating Medicaid. First of all, is Medicaid bad insurance because no provider will see you if you have it? This question is important, because if no provider will see you, even though you have insurance, it amounts to what we call coverage without care. What's the point of having a Medicaid card if no doctor will see you with it? Here is what we found. Our lottery winners had much better access to care than those in our control group. They were more likely to have seen a doctor in the previous year, had more outpatient visits, and were more likely to have filled a prescription. Medicaid led to an increase of planned hospital admissions, particularly related to the treatment of heart disease. Medicaid also led to a sustained increase in the use of emergency rooms. This last finding triggers more questions. Weren't supporters of Medicaid claiming that expansion would reduce use of emergency rooms? Were the previously uninsured going to the ER because they didn't know that they were supposed to see a primary care provider instead? Proponents of Medicaid had hoped that primary care would largely replace emergency room use except in extreme emergencies, and maybe this will happen in the long run, but it didn't happen in the two years of our study. Instead, primary care and emergency room use was complementary. Medicaid increased use of both. This makes sense to me as a former emergency room social worker. In my experience, people take themselves to the ER when they're in pain, scared something is seriously wrong, or in crisis. Retrospectively, it isn't always an emergency, but this is kind of why ERs are there. I once took my son to the ER because he was pale and lethargic and crying with stomach pain, and they cured him with an ibuprofen and a very expensive popsicle. You can't always know in the moment if it's a true emergency until you're evaluated by a health professional. The uninsured, who will be billed for an ER visit, may choose to sit with the pain or fear or uncertainty instead. The takeaway point is, those who are using the emergency room also tended to be seeing a provider in the community, perhaps because they had genuine health problems. Medicaid was certainly not coverage without care. Another concern, the fear that Medicaid doctors provide low quality care. Our study cannot speak to how Medicaid providers compare with all providers, but those who won the Medicaid lottery and were receiving care rated that as higher quality than those in our control group who were also using care. They were more likely to have a regular doctor and be receiving recommended health screenings. And there were health benefits to this increased access. Our Medicaid recipients rated their health as better than their control group peers, and they were more likely to say that their health was stable or even improving. We saw an astonishing 30% reduction in clinical depression. We saw an increase in the detection and treatment of diabetes. On the flip side, we didn't see improvements in hypertension or in high blood sugar among diabetics. Should we take this to mean that Medicaid doesn't work? Some are saying it means exactly that. And there is a subtext to this assertion, somehow private insurance would have performed better. I don't know if that's true. Private insurance has never been put to the test. There haven't been any clinical trials that randomized people to private insurance versus being uninsured and then followed them to compare their health outcomes. We wouldn't see many variant volunteers for such a study. What is clear is that Medicaid led to numerous improvements in health, and we saw no evidence of decline. It's fair to say Medicaid isn't dangerous. 
Last question. Were people receiving anything from Medicaid that they couldn't already get from the healthcare safety net? The answer is yes. We saw substantial benefits to Medicaid beyond increased access to providers and reported improvements of health. A benefit that policymakers may be at risk of undervaluing is financial stability and peace of mind. Our Medicaid winners had more money to spend on other things while less was consumed by healthcare. They were less likely to be borrowing money from friends or family or their prescriptions. They were less likely to be skipping payment on other bills. And they were less likely to have an account in collections. And when they did, they owed less. This also means that more providers were getting paid, which is good for everybody. Peace of mind is a little harder to measure, and it wasn't something we included in our surveys. But we did do unstructured interviews with hundreds of people in our study, asking them to tell us their healthcare story. I'm going to do a real quick qualitative analysis for you. Medicaid isn't perfect, but being uninsured is really tough. Being uninsured is scary when you're healthy, and downright terrifying when you aren't. Peace of mind was the knowledge that if something seems wrong with your health, you can see somebody about it. And if something is wrong with your health, medical bills aren't going to take the food off your table or claim the roof over your head. Some people had alarming symptoms, and getting to see a provider meant finding out they were actually healthy. Think about this for a moment. In these cases, insurance may have done nothing to improve health. But the woman who has been worrying over a lump in her breast for two years has learned that it isn't cancer. She feels better. She has peace of mind. There are many compelling stories that I could share from our interviews, but I would like to conclude today by talking about somebody who didn't participate in our study. My sister, Rachel, a single mother living in Idaho, a state that did not expand Medicaid. Like many single parents, Rachel faced difficult choices in making ends meet. At some point, she decided to give up insurance through her employer. She felt it was just too expensive. Rachel worked as a hospice nurse. In the spring of 2015, she passed out at work, hitting her head. An ambulance took her to the ER, where she received a CAT scan and was discharged with a diagnosis of a minor concussion. She had a hard time recovering, though. Months passed. She couldn't get back to work. She could barely get out of bed. Workers' compensation insurance continued to pay for her to see providers about her head injury, but it seems nobody was asking, what made her pass out in the first place? Without being able to work, she had little income. Had she lived in the neighboring states, of Washington, Oregon, or even Nevada, she would have qualified for Medicaid. Five months later, she was back in an ER, where this time they found tumors in her lungs and later in her kidneys. Rachel was 44 years old, with stage four cancer, no insurance, and no treatment options. She was dying and she didn't even have insurance to pay for hospice after 15 years of providing hospice care for others. I felt absolutely helpless. I study health insurance. I study the uninsured and access to care, and I had no idea how to help her. Rachel wasn't eligible for Medicaid in Idaho. She wasn't eligible for Medicare, and she wasn't gonna be given private insurance after she was already sick. Rachel was reeling from her diagnosis. Her kids were reeling. Our entire family was reeling. Only three weeks after finding out that she had cancer, Rachel died of it. I don't know if having access to affordable insurance would have saved Rachel's life. The problem is, I also don't know that it wouldn't have. Her doctors confirmed that the cancer could have been caught much earlier. We, her adult family, have to live with these what ifs. So do her four children. Even if the outcome would have ultimately been the same, I would love to have peace of mind that it 
wasn't lack of wealth that cost Rachel her life. Everything that I have learned as a social worker, as a Medicaid researcher, and unfortunately as a sister, tells me that it is time to set aside our myths and have a thoughtful national dialogue about the Medicaid program. We can turn to the strong evidence that does exist about what works and what needs to be improved. And where there is a lack of evidence, I hope that those of us with insurance will think about how much we value our own health security and peace of mind. Medicaid isn't a cure for everything, but it is decidedly better than being uninsured. Thank you.